and then give you back the hosting. Okay, that should work. Uh, okay, you're, you're back, you're host now. I'll stop oh. interrupting, sorry. No, you're fine. Well, this is Hinduism by us. Okay, so we're going to start with the human condition, which, uh, next slide. Um, let's break it down for what the IB uh, defines it as in the cheat sheet. And what that is, is uh, Hindus believe humans are caught in samsara. The, the Atman soul is condemned to an endless cycle of reincarnation as a result of karma actions. Um, one sec. Uh, bad karma has a corrupting effect on the universe. Okay, so I'm going to start by bringing down what samsara is, and it's a little bit different than it is in uh, Buddhism. And samsara in, in Hinduism is the belief of the endless cycle of reincarnation, which is characterized by actions in past lives. This is where humans are on earth. As opposed to Buddhism, there's a self and soul that passes on to its new lives known as the Atman. Hinduism seeks to end the cycle of samsara, which is also similar to Buddhism. And the cycle of samsara in Hindu Hinduism seeks to attain moksha, which is defined as the release from the cycle of rebirth. Uh, returning to the Brahman, which is the force of the entire universe, is the final de destination after achieving moksha. So now this, now this is where you participate, and I kind of answered this question, but why doesn't uh, somebody kind of define what samsara is in Buddhism? <laughs> um, so samsara is the endless cycle of rebirth, and it's different from Buddhism, because I think Buddhism has to do with the soul. Um, is that it? Yeah, kind of. Kind of, yeah. What, what does Buddhism teach about the soul? So Buddhism has a different, like, teaching about the soul. It's like a non-dualism, but there is no soul. Like, exactly. Very there good. There is no self. Very good. And this is where I kind of compared it, which is, um, this is kind of the differences, just so we can understand um, that it's not the exact same a few slight differences. Uh, so breaking the cycle of samsara leads to moksha in Hinduism. The end of the cycle leads to the return to the Brahman or the source of the universe. And the Atman is an everlasting soul, which contrasts the Buddhist belief of Anatta. And then in Buddhism, breaking the cycle of samsara comes from enlightenment. Nirvana is, is detachment from cravings and desires, more of a mental state of peace than a return to any universal source. And the belief in anatta or no soul contrasts the Atman belief. And now we're going to go uh, to karma. So uh, somebody um, define what you know about karma so far. Isn't it like the like sum of all your actions in like your present life and then how that affects you in the afterlife? Uh, yeah, kind of. Yeah, it's actions. Uh, uh, hey, I'm sorry, can I jump in real quick? Just a reminder, those of you who are in the Sikhism unit, keep in mind that it's kind of nerve-wracking um, to have a quiet class. So as much as you can participate, realize that tomorrow you're going to need these guys to participate in yours. So if you can jump in, try and jump in as often as you can, just as an encouragement. And hopefully they'll do the same for you, okay? Okay. So, oh, Sam, go back to karma. You guys I, have. I'm not going. Oh, uh, Smalley, can you push put it back to, to the previous oh, yeah. one? Does anybody can anybody mention anything else we learned about karma? Mm, your karma determines like 
how good or how bad your rebirth will be. Mm -hmm. And if, if we could call, define karma in one synonym, what, what might you choose as a synonym for that word karma, according to Buddhism? Maybe merit? Mm, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what's another word you could use? Yeah, merit, maybe, if it's a good thing that you did. But yeah. what's a word that would do it, if, whether it's, what, what's that? Consequence. Ooh, nice. Mm, there you go. <laughs> Consequence, perfect. All right, Sam, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so consequence is a, is a really good word for it. Or, uh, the IB uh, cheat seat says actions, which you know, also relates to consequences, obviously. Um, so the term's literal definition is action in Hinduism, like I was just saying earlier. And karma is what determines who, uh, who a person becomes in their next life, which I don't think I worded that the best because it's kind of like, since the Atman is endless, in a way, the same person. But yeah. Um, and, uh, and I'm still presenting that. Um, so in Hinduism, case or social classes, which is what something Sonali is going to go over late and uh, later in the presentation, are what Hindus believe a person was born into. Those in lower classes having the lowest social standing and those in the higher class cases having the highest social standing. With uh, karma or action, a person can determine their next life, which if full of good actions can lead to a birth into a higher case. Bad karma also has corrupting effect on the universe, which can cause it damage. So, so what, how do you think the case system relates to karma? Um, I think you get set into the caste system based on your karma from the previous life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone else have any comments on it? Um, you can raise your caste level by basically being a good person. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we can move on to the next slide now. So, wait. Is that the right one? No, never mind. Okay, the Atman is literally translates to self, everyone. Essentially, the everlasting soul passes on after death, either uh, in either moksha or reincarnation. What Hindus believe, it's what Hindus believe make up personality. That's why I said uh, in the previous slide that uh, you're kind of the same person. So it's not, I don't know, yeah. So. So now I'm going to have you answer this question, which is explain how samsara, the Atman, and karma relate to, def to define the Hindu view on the human condition, kind of just connecting everything back to what my section was about. So the way I gathered it is that, so you're in this cycle of samsara, which is just like the cycle of um, endless rebirth, as a result of karma or the consequences of your actions and you kind of remain like you're the same soul just being recycled into different lives is how I, how I viewed it or how I picked it up because the Atman is like you said the everlasting soul so it's like the same soul just being um, reborn into different lives and stuff like that yeah that's a good um yeah you got most of it there so let's go to the next one now so, where i can uh, go more in depth so the review which is basically just me combining everything the samsara is the endless cycle of life and death the atman is what travels through the cycle of samsara the atman is similar to the idea of a soul uh carmen determines if a person's reincarnation is favorable or un unfavorable Karma also determines if a person can end the cycle of rebirth known as moksha. Okay, so um, <laughs> this is my part of the presentation and I want you guys to look at this picture and um, think of what kind of imagery you might see, what you think it represents, um, similarities with religious topics in Buddhism for example, and um, topics that have already been mentioned by Sam. 
Um, so in the picture, I see the infinity loop. Um, I think that kind of shows a cycle of rebirth and the whole idea of samsara that's like an endless cycle. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, yeah. Uh, next slide. And the one after that. <laughs> okay, so this is where are we going to a favorable or unfavorable, unfavorable reincarnation after death. So what is a favorable or unfavorable reincarnation? Um, Hindus believe in samsara and that some lives aren't spent as humans and maybe seen, spent as plants, animals, and sometimes even divine beings. And if you are a human, it can affect the caste system that you are like where you're placed into as we discussed earlier. Um, they also believe that some lives are better than others and this is affected by karma. Um, they believe that reincarnation takes time and you may not immediately go into the next life and that you spend some time in between uh, these two lives in the astral plane. Um, and the whole concept is kind of reaching death to be born anew. So the astral plane is a plane of existence where one's soul, the astral body, resides between reincarnated lives. This is also known as the second world, following the first world, which contains the, the physical body. Um, so one of the sacred texts that I found um, talking about rebirth is from the Upanishad, um, the Manduka Upanishad, um, thus abiding by the injunctions of the three Vedas and the desiring desires, they are subject to death and rebirth. Um, they cover religious uh, and philosophical thinking. They also address basic principles such as samsara, karma, and dharma. Um, and so a question that I have for you guys is what can you infer about in, about in Hinduism, if similar to Buddhism, and Buddhism's desire, Buddhism, sorry, similar to Buddhism's desires to keep you from Nirvana when talking about desires. Do you need me to reword that? Well, I think it's a very good question, actually. Uh, it's a complicated question, but I definitely see this this great find that you found. This this quote is uh, really interesting in the context of what we've already learned in Buddhism. Can you guys figure it out? Do you see the a hint at some ideas that we see reflected in Buddhism later? Desiring desire. What was that word for desire again? Uh... Not dukkha. Is it oh, dukkha? No. Oh, um, right. The clinging. Uh, what was yeah. It? Oh, oh crap. <laughs> my brain party de deprogrammed. Um, but yeah, that that term. <laughs> <laughs> and that and term. What are you talking about just can't think of the word. <laughs> And the and the the sacred text is saying what is the outcome of that clinging of that desiring. Just um, what, what's the quote say? It's a subject to death and rebirth, so you're kind of, like desires kind of keep you trapped in yeah. the cycle. Great find, Tessa. Thank you. Um, so moving on. Um, eschatology. Um, in Hinduism, like most religions, they have a personal uh, or not less like a personal eschatology um, for like an individual person. Um, and this is, again, kind of wrapping up samsara, the endless cycle of birth, life, death, and repeat. Um, and something that happens to you in one life will come back to you uh, in the next, good or bad. And that is all. Okay, so this is um, my section. I also have um, where are we going, except I'm focusing on moksha. So next slide. Okay, so there's like two main vocabulary words I, that um, basically connect to what I'm talking about. First, there's moksha, and that itself means uh, the liberation from the cycle of death and rebirth. And then I said um, this concept of liberation can also be found within Buddhism. And then the, the other word that's also connected to it is Brahman. And Brahman means a formless, genderless source of all reality. 
and is the universe and the things that make up the universe. And I kind of also just wanted to add this to like help you guys out, like maybe just in case, I don't know, we have a vocab quiz soon, because who knows, but I also kind of wanted to include the word Brahma, because Brahma is actually um, a deity within Hinduism who's known as the creator. Like, so I kind of just wanted to include that just in case you guys might end up mixing them up because they pretty much look almost the same. And then the next slide. Okay, so the concept explained. So basically, Hindus believe that they're stuck in samsara, the cycle of death and rebirth. So as a result, their main goal in life is actually kind of to just, um, actually, I think you could argue it depends on um, the person. But for the most part, their main goal is actually to achieve liberation from um, samsara, which is moksha. And they believe that moksha can be somehow achieved, um, can be achieved by somehow finding a way to get back to Brahman. And um, so there's the different schools kind of have a different way that they believe or different methods that you can use to get back to um, Brahman. Um, so like one example is like by practicing Dharma. So, so by practicing Dharma, they can achieve moksha. And yeah, like I said, different schools kind of um, have different variations as to what they believe can achieve moksha. And then the oh, Dinah, next slide. Dinah, before you move on, uh, can you make sure people understand that the, 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 the basic difference between moksha and nirvana? Oh. Um, Is, so, has it... Has anyone picked that up? What the di difference is between moksha and nirvana? Does anybody remember what nirvana literally means? Um, <laughs> what was that? Um, anybody remember? It has to do with a candle, something that happens to a candle. Um, wait. Does it mean it was like put out? Yes. So nirvana is simply an extinction. Oh. A, a blowing out extinction, right? So someone who's who's been listening to this lesson, how is moksha different from simply extinction? Oh, because you're because you're not your soul's not disappearing or like ceasing to exist. You're just right. rejoining the, right. your source. Exactly. So it's a conscious, there's a consciousness there. There's an enjoyment of that rejoining. You know, there, there's, you know, positive feelings and emotions that are attached to this concept of moksha, as opposed to the mm -hmm. Theravada concept of nirvana, where it's simply, you're done, you're out. No more, no more pain, but also no more you. So oh. where nirvana is like the candle goes out, right? moksha is like, the candlelight joining the flame or something like that. Oh yeah, a nice way to put it. Uh, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, any experts in the room? No, that's that's accurate. <laughs> okay, thank you. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dida, go, you go ahead. I just wanted to make sure people were understanding there is something significantly different between moksha and nirvana, okay? Okay, yeah. Sorry. Thank you. That also helped me a lot. Okay, good. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, and then so the next slide, I have like sacred texts. Um, it's, it's kind of basically three quotes. So the first one is, he who knows the supreme Brahman rarely becomes Brahman. The next quote is, there are three branches of duty, sacrifice, study, and charity are the first. All these attain to the worlds of the virtuous, but only one who is firmly established in Brahman attains immorality. And then the last quote at the bottom says, one who knows Brahman becomes Brahman. And um, to the side, I kind of um, uh, concluded that they kind of all point back to achieving oneness with Brahman as the solution. And then the next slide. Okay, so yeah. So I said um, there's a common pattern of the Upanishads actually focusing more on the method of achieve, achieving moksha. Um, and I thought it was like interesting though, because, I, well, like from what I've found, 
I think it said that like I, I couldn't really find any text from the Vedas themselves um, like directly mentioning moksha. It's actually in the Upanishads where it's kind of more uh, mentioned. So um, yeah, and I just basically at the bottom I said that the Upanishads conclude that the solution to the problem of samsara and achieving moksha is when you achieve oneness with Brahman. Um, I just kind of personally thought it was interesting because they also, it's also kind of viewed um, for the Hindus, like the Vedas are kind of like um, the most holy or, or like the most sacred text. And the Upanishads are kind of like, um, kind of viewed as a, a little less holy, I guess you could say. So I just kind of thought it was interesting how um, the the one or the seemingly most important one didn't exactly directly mention it. Okay, and then the next slide. So this artwork is um, actually an artistic, it's a representation of, I don't know how to pronounce that. Does anyone know how to pronounce that? Um, I'm just going to guess, uh, na, na, na yoga. Um, and then I basically said that this method is most heavily relied on to achieve moksha for those specifically within the Ad, Advaita Vedanta school of Hinduism. So that's just kind of one of, um, like one very popular method within that school used to achieve moksha. And then the next slide. Okay, so these are kind of just my review questions. Um, they're pretty easy. So the, f the first one is, um, what is moksha? Um, that one's just freedom from samsara. Yeah, and then uh, the next question is, what is Brahman? Um, a formless, genderless source of reality. Yeah. And then my last question is, how do Hindus believe we can achieve moksha? By we can achieve moksha by returning to the Brahmin. Yeah. Okay, I think that's all for my section. Okay, so now we have, how do we get there by me? Okay, so you can get there by performing actions in line with the Dharma. And according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, in Hinduism, Dharma is the religious and moral law governing individual conduct. And then I have this quote from the Upanishad. It says, nothing is higher than Dharma. The weak overcomes the stronger by Dharma as over a king. Truly that Dharma is the truth. Therefore, when a man speaks the truth, they say he speaks the Dharma. And if he speaks Dharma, they say he speaks the truth, for both are one. So according to this sacred text quote from the Upanishad I found on Wikipedia, Dharma and truth are the same. How do we get there? By performing actions pertinent to jati. And the definition of jati from Encyclopedia Britannica is, um, the term is derived from the Sanskrit jata, which means born or brought into existence and indicates a form of existence determined by birth. So Dati is basically a caste system. And then we have the story of the Gita. Um, this is a story that takes place on a battlefield when Arjuna, a great warrior, refuses to fight. Lord Krishna comes to tell him that he should fight. He then continues to explain to him the truth about Dharma. The truth is the truth for Arjuna is that he is in the warrior caste, his jati. Therefore, it is in his own dharma to fight as a warrior against evil. So the lesson of that story is that everyone has their own dharma that they have to react to. Everyone faces difficult choices that are placed in front of them because of the caste that they have, but they must act on them according to their dharma. And then this is a depiction of that story. Um, it's called Krishna instructs Arjuna on the battlefield. And then we have a discussion question, which is how can your jati affect your dharma? So I'm thinking that dharma 
the dharma that you follow depends on your jati. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. So if you weren't, so if you weren't in a in a warrior caste, would that mean that maybe you shouldn't fight? You should. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because um, Arjuna felt bad. Like I don't think he wanted to fight because he felt bad that it like wasn't peaceful uh -huh. and like he would have to probably kill people. And then Krishna comes to say he shouldn't feel bad because that's the situation that he has been placed in by his caste. So his, he wouldn't be going against his dharma because it is his dharma to fight. Okay. And then um, in conclusion, how do we get there? By living your life in accordance to your dharma based on your jati. All right, so this is my section, um, and I'm going to be talking about modern Indian law and like their democracy and the Hindu caste system. So basically, there's been a long um, history of uh, the journey to India's democracy. So currently, there's been effects of British colonialism in the past, and um, there's been effects of religious conflict between the Hindu majority and the Muslim minority. And this party um, that is in power right now, the BJP, as of their party in parliament, and the shift towards a election only and growing industrialization. What, what does that uh, mean, election only democracy? What, what are they referring to there? Um, instead of uh, just the parliament and uh, uh, the body of government electing the officials, uh, the people are now allowed to elect. Okay. <clears throat> and so with uh, growing industrialization, uh, there's also been a or, uh, evidence of economic disparity in the population. And so the picture I have on the right is actually the current minister. So basically, a modern law states that one is not allowed to discriminate based on color, caste, gender, etc. However, many years of tradition and mentality of uh, the people living there cannot easily be changed. And this issue is not unique to India, as we all know. And um, discrimination could have arose from the religion itself, but there is no sacred text explicitly stating uh, the support of a hierarchical caste system. And interpretations from uh, individuals who follow the religion could have established the concept of this hierarchy. And generally, humans have a natural tendency to group their surroundings by a single identifying aspect. So in this case, it was caste. And uh, people have ultimately given themselves the authority to decide whether someone or something is more superior. So since there's countless historical examples, what are some that we've studied in school? In other words, examples of, of us and them that different cultures have come up with? Yeah, just like um, examples of discrimination that we mm. know. Oh, we don't know anything about discrimination here. <laughs> <laughs> um, probably like many times in history of America. Hmm. Um, probably yeah, the no. majority of what our American history, about? yeah. What? The enslavement of Africans and, the, and the whole civil rights stuff and the African Americans not having right to other people in the population exactly. or women not having the right to vote for a while mm -hmm. yeah or native americans not having the right to keep their land yeah and then getting shot at when they do protest that kind of stuff that's okay yeah i guess we have some of that here <laughs> yes <laughs> Okay, so this is just kind of like a discussion question. Um, when you think of India, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Taj Mahal. Bollywood. <laughs> Actually, that's why I, weren't, I wasn't expecting those answers. <laughs> um, probably. So think, oh, sorry. oh, I'm sorry. You can go. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say, as an insider, I think of family. Aww. Aww. I think of farmland is what I <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so basically, um, a lot of people that I know and like, uh, they usually think of poverty as being the first thing, like especially India being a third uh, world country. And so I just wanted to show you guys that India is not all like that. And so there's, um, here's just some pictures of like skyscrapers. And, 
And so basically this is a Hindu caste system and um, it starts with the Brahmins at the top who are priests and academics. And then the Kshatriyas who are warriors and kings and the Vaishyas who are merchants and landowners. The Shudras who are commoners, peasants and servants. And then the untouchables at the very bottom um, the, who are the street cleaners and the latrine cleaners. And so the caste system is ultimately hereditary, so it remains unchanged throughout one's life. So no matter what one does, it, um, it's, you, you can be identified of your caste like uh, with your last name. So it's not something that you're able to change. So, so I just have a question really quick. If, if your caste system is determined by your last name, are people not allowed to change their last names legally? Like, um, in India, it's pretty uncommon for you to change your last name. Mm. So, but I mean, it, let's say like you, like you're an immigrant and you move here, like you can tell mm -hmm. that, but like you'll still have that identifying aspect of your class. Okay. And here's some stats. So, um, the rate of intercaste is only 5%. So marriages across caste or religion are pretty uncommon. Um, most Indian families still prefer marriages arranged within their religion and their caste. And basically upholding tradition, culture, and purity is the woman's responsibility. And if she marries outside the traditional boundaries, she's tarnishing the honor of her community and family. So in a, in a survey conducted in 2016, the majority of respondents were opposed to intercaste and interreligious marriages. And a lot of people were in favor of a law banning such marriages. Wow. Oh wow. And yet the and yet the, the laws of India do protect those actions. Mm -hmm. it, but culture doesn't protect those actions. Yeah, and ultimately like since there's the, there's a huge uh, population and it's really hard to control culture over law and so a lot of times the effects of culture take over law. Mm -hmm. And this is just more stats and the rate of honor killings which are basically um if people marry outside of the boundaries, uh, their parents or family will actually kill them just because they don't allow that. And so the rate of that is 77 murder cases in 2016 reported with honor killing as a motive. And Keep in mind, of course, that India has a massive population. So that's, that's way below 1% there, right? Yeah. It's, it's significant, but we also need to keep in mind, doesn't India have the highest population second only to China? Mm -hmm. They have almost 1.4 billion people at the moment. Right. And so we have to keep that in mind when we look at that number 77. And these murder cases generally take place out in the countryside. Am I, am I correct? It's more of a mm -hmm. rural, traditional thing? Yeah, it's definitely, this does, this does not take place in like the cities, and right. the more developed places. <clears throat> And so this violence though is highly underreported and these numbers do not accurately reflect uh, the growing conservative social attitudes. Mm -hmm. But um, the majority of the population who are conservative are the older generations who are trying to uphold like their tradition and culture from the past. And so what are, your, some, what are some of your opinions about this? What do you guys think? Do we have something that is, is, what's the word? Do we have anything that's equivalent, not the same, but equivalent in our culture? Oh, uh, well, um, I mean, not necessarily as severe, but I feel like, and it's not like required exactly, but I've heard my parents talk to me a bunch of times about marrying someone within the medical field because because like if I'm expected to go into the med like I'm going into the medical field so I'm expected to find a spouse within the same field as me to maintain sort of like I don't know the image of um interesting I don't know <laughs> that makes sense because I know that I was I was taught my whole childhood that I was expected to marry someone within my religion so that, mm -hmm. that might be quite similar yep. anybody else think of anything that's that's equivalent in our culture oh we got crickets in the room 
Okay, well, I can move on then. Okay. <laughs> Do you guys think this is a socioeconomic problem or a, a religious problem, a religious problem, or both? Um, Definitely I both. Both, because I feel like culture, along with their socioeconomic stuff, I think contributes to a problem. I to to this problem, I guess. But I I kind of agree with what you were saying that sometimes culture outweighs the law. And sometimes mm -hmm. maintaining that like cultural image and like keeping in line with culture sometimes tends to be more important than like the law. Yeah, I, you're exactly right. I, I'm glad you brought up that socioeconomic issue because I mean, in, in our culture, people who are more wealthy, are, are they not more likely to try and find a mate who is also as wealthy as they? I mean, is that a trend that we see in our culture? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's an economic thing, right? You're wanting to preserve the, the opportunities and the privileges that you have for your children. I mean, I, I think we have a high culture, do we not? Yeah, yeah, I, I would say so, yeah. Um, generally, uh, you, we, have, we have that expression, marry down. What is that? What does that mean? Surely you've heard that expression, marrying down or marrying up. Oh. oh oh like yeah yeah like marrying mm -hmm. someone like has like more money right or marrying and someone generally, who has the lower income branch yeah. right and which which gender is is generally considered it's okay if they marry down a little bit but which gender is not allowed to marry down generally it's considered lowly to do it maybe woman right mm -hmm. right M men are allowed to marry down a little bit but women it's considered quite shameful uh, uh, but it sounds like in this culture, it doesn't matter what gender you are, marrying down is is really not a good idea. Mm -hmm. mm. So I said both because like we were talking about, the socioeconomic issues reinforce older ideas and concepts such as the caste system and patriarchal significance in society due to exposure to only a single environment or surroundings. So they're not really um, exposed to other things. And so the interpretations of religion uh, also serve as a form of justification for many beliefs and opinions of individuals who support the caste system. And ultimately, this mentality cannot be abolished immediately, but as time progresses, new generations can help shift the perspectives of others. And so this is one of my vocab words. Um, gunas and they're basically the qualities of the created world and uh, there's sattvas, rajas, and tamas which um, those are all adjectives to describe them and the literal definition means thread and it, they're considered the original materials that make up reality and the three gunas are present in everyone and everything so the effects of them defines the character of someone or something of uh, nature and it determines the progress of life. It can also mean an operational principle or tendency of something or someone in, uh, as defined in human behavior studies, personality, innate nature, and psychological attributes of an individual. So I included this because um, basically the pers uh, people who support the caste system, I wanted to um, basically like their motives or like the reasons that they, su they still support that. And the same with this, um, sin, bop, is a formation or a consequence of desire-ridden actions, evil nature, karma, maya, and the disregard of dharma. And it's, the, its purpose is to facilitate the order and regularity of the world, enforce dharma, and the evolution of beings through the effective process. Sin can arise from intentional or unintentional actions and through negligence or ignorance. And it's very different from the Abrahamic religions because there's no concept of original sin in Hinduism. Um, it's rather an aspect of a duality, its opposite being virtue, virtue or dharma. And ultimately, accumulated sin can be removed, neutralized, or cleansed through self-effort and devotion to God. So I did yoga. And so there's a, there's a definition of yoga that we're really common with, with, or we're really familiar with, which is a physical discipline. 
that's used to keep the body health, healthy and achieve masculine poses required. But then for Hinduism, there's also the um, the goal of the goal of yoga is to achieve mashka and enter Brahman. And there are three three main different forms of yoga that can be categorized as yan, which is philosophical as the way to knowledge, bhakti, which which is devotion and love, and karma, which is active and for every day, and for everyday life. So, um, so so when I did my research for yan, I've seen it. I saw it pronounced as gyan and gyan yu, but mostly gyan. And so it translates in Sanskrit to knowledge or wisdom, and it has a focus on treating the true nature of reality or absolute consciousness, consciousness by merging one's Atman, their inner self with Brahman. And this often is focused with quiet meditation rather than active moving. And so because it takes a lot of um, patience and, and essentially meditation, it's is generally preferred for those who are more philosophical or those who, <coughs> sorry, for those who have, uh, or who are trying to live a more monastic way of life. So for a discussion question, what would be the advantage of quiet meditative yoga to help, meditative yoga to help one achieve their goals in yon yoga? Meditative quiet, because when you're quiet, you let your you let your mind do the exploring, I guess, without any distraction. So, uh, maybe it also like since it's also quiet, it allows you to focus more. It's kind of what I got. Anything else? Or... The, um, do, what is the purpose of yo yoga? It's to help one achieve uh, essentially alignment. Oh, so moksha. Moksha, yeah. Okay. So bhakti is, um, bhakti focuses on devotion to God. It's a little confusing because there are many deities and gods within, uh, within Hinduism, but it helps to remember that that when when we're referring to god we're referring to like main gods and just generally the the energy of of god so so essentially when you're doing bhakti yoga you're attempting to see god through personal terms as like a parent figure or family member or even as a friend and to see god in all forms beyond one's deity it requires a little bit more movement than gyan but it is usually meant to be very slow and controlled so that you're building your strength um and it's and it's preferred for those who are, who are more emotional or want to improve their emotional connection or their emotional aspects of life. So, and what other religions do we find a physical activity as a form of religious experience? Uh, is it Tai Chi? Is that what it was called? Oh, yeah. Tai Chi. Taoism. Uh, There was another word for it. There was another like Tai Chi Chuan. Yeah, yeah. And then there was like the Americanized version of. Mm. I remember, like, I see. I remember things very vaguely, but I. <laughs> <laughs> this is the I cost can't. of us not having exams. We never had to study real hard. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what's another one? I think we talked about deity yoga in Buddhism oh, too. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. Was that for Vajrayana? Yeah. Okay. So why would there be a focus on strength for bhakti yoga? Mm -hmm. Good question. Maybe because being emotional, it takes a lot of like, for the human mind and for the body, like both, when you're in an emotional or vulnerable state, it takes a lot of strength to, um, to like own up to it and take control of what you're feeling, and especially in connection with a higher power like this, um, it's not something that is taken very lightly or can be taken very lightly. Hmm, nice, good answer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so
So karma yoga is represents action or de dedicated work, which which it's um, suggested that people incorporate karma yoga into their everyday life. And it's to help break that cycle of bad karma, which is caused from, or which is happens from cause and effect. So essentially, you're um, you're breaking a cycle of bad karma when you do karma yoga, and you do this by detaching from yourself from your self ego as you as you create a work process through through your yoga and generally karma yoga is a little bit more physical than other types and you're focusing on your movements and what you're doing rather than like yourself or your inner self so this is a link to a yoga video it's not specifically for any type of yoga it's kind of hard to find a quick video for that so you don't have to do it if you don't want to but <laughs> you guys want to do yoga <laughs> let me save that for tomorrow morning <laughs> okay okay <laughs> they're shaming me <laughs> Okay, so basically this is the last section of um, our presentation. And as many of you know, Hinduism is known as being the religion of many gods. And so I basically wanted to give you guys a quick rundown of the most important gods or, um, and the most important gods that my family personally, we venerate. And so I know Dinah touched on the very beginning, but Brahma is the creator and he's the first member of the Hindu Trinity. He's known for being the creator of all things that make up the universe. And then Vishnu, the preserver, who is the second member of the Hindu Trinity, he maintains the order and harmony of the universe. And he's worshipped in many forms and several avatars, including Rama and Krishna. And Shiva is the destroyer, who is a third member of the Hindu Trinity. And this is super interesting because he's tasked with destroying the universe in order to prepare for its renewal at each point at the end of each cycle of time and it's considered his actions are considered to be regenerate regenerative so they're essential for life to go on i have a quick question i don't know if it's personal but i was just curious how come you guys choose to venerate these three specific ones well these three are like comparable to in christianity the father the son and the holy spirit because um, they're kind of like the main three that make up all, or they kind of like birth the rest of the, the gods and the deities in a sense. Mm -hmm. And so um, they're basically, throughout like all of Hinduism, they're considered the most important. Interesting. Um, the next one is uh, Ganpati, who is a remover of obstacles, aka Ganesha, and he's Shiva's first son. And he's super unique because he has an elephant head, and that's a whole nother story. But um, almost all Hindu households have a picture or a statue of Ganesha. And oftentimes you'll see them like having a little idol of him in um, their car or like a picture of them somewhere in their house. And um, Saraswati is the goddess of learning, and she's worshipped as uh, the goddess of wisdom, speech, and music as well. And oftentimes, um, Hindus pray to Saraswati before beginning any intellectual pursuit. So oftentimes, when um, people start the first day of school, or if they're going uh, for like a job interview, they often pray to her. Oh. And Lakshmi is the goddess of good fortune, wealth, and well-being. And she's just like the goddess of good luck. So along with Saraswati, they, uh, Hindus often pray to Lakshmi as well. And the last goddess that I'm going to touch on is uh, Durga Devi. And she's a goddess who fights in order to restore Dharma. And uh, she's terrifying to her adversaries, but full of love and compassion for her devotees. And she's seen as like super strong. And she also has a lot of different avatars. And I think it's super cool that she sits on a tiger. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And that's it. Because if I talked about all of them, then we would be here all day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You guys did great. Um, real quick, 
um, I know Sam is has a, a work thing that's messing him up. Um, is there any way that we all can pick a time where we can all be together? And I'm, I'm also, this is a, a long lesson. I, I don't know about you guys, but I realize all of a sudden I'm out of the habit of, of, of lectures. Uh, and so maybe having a, a second one tomorrow might be a bit much. We might, are, are the rest of you guys out of habit of, of lectures as much as I am? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, we have to go back to school this summer. I'm gonna be in trouble. <laughs> um, is there, Sam? Real quick, is there some time this this week where you can be present? Um. Yeah, I think I'm available on uh, Wednesday. On Wednesday, is does anybody else want? We can just stick stick to the schedule, and that's fine. Does anybody want kind of a break in between the two major lectures? Yeah, it would yeah. work for me better yeah. if yeah. we missed Wednesday. Okay. All right, so Wednesday, uh, eleven o'clock. Is there anyone that can't make it Wednesday at eleven o'clock? Speak now or forever. Hold your peace. Okay, well then let's reschedule for Wednesday at 11 o'clock so we have a day to, to recuperate from school. Yes, <laughs> wonderful. Okay, um, thank you guys. Thank you, the other team for participating. Uh, mm -hmm. Very helpful. Keep in mind that everybody gets graded on whether or not they're present on at Wednesday at 11 o'clock, okay? Okay. Okay. Right. Great. I'll see you. T see you Wednesday. Good job, guys. Good job. Yeah, give them a Good hand. Good job. at like answering all the questions. Like we didn't even have to ask you guys to speak. No, you. you everybody did wonderful today. Thank you. Yay. See you Wednesday. Yay. Bye. All right. Thank Bye. you guys. Bye. Bye.